Welcome everyone to this Force Friday. Uh, this week, once more, we're gonna talk about force in a different occupation. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about illustration, which is a huge occupation, right? Huge. If you think about illustration, this goes back hundreds, if not, well, hundreds, probably if not thousands of years on how artists and art has been used to communicate ideas all the way from children's books to uh, editorial, you know, magazines and such, uh, movie posters, uh, propaganda posters, right? Like illustration has been used in every way, shape and form you could possibly think of. Um, so artists have held a really strong space because of that. Uh, what we're gonna do today is we're going to cover uh, more of the current artists that are out there. Uh, we'll go back um, a little bit at the very beginning of our video. Uh, and again, the goal here is to present to you guys, hey, you know what, force actually does work across all these different occupations. One of the things we get asked all the time is, that's great, you guys are teaching us how to draw, um, but so what, like, what do you do with it, right? So we're here to start showing you, here's the different things that you can do with it and show it to you in current um, past uh, and current artists, right? So uh, as usual, before we get up and running here, let's say hello to the gang uh gallery there we go how's it going how's it going swenley yeah good forces everywhere guys it's everywhere <laughs> that's right <laughs> exactly inescapable <laughs> and how are you doing return jay i'm getting really excited for this one <laughs> how are you guys doing good as good as possible <laughs> as you guys know <laughs> Most of you don't know out there maybe, but I'm supposed to be moving this weekend and it's been quite entertaining, I have to say, the whole process. So we'll see where we'll be next Friday. I have no idea. <laughs> see where we're at. So um, let's get through this, right? Let's talk about these different artists. We have a lot of, um, yeah, we've got a lot of artwork to look at today with you and hopefully it'll inspire you. I think one of the things uh, I try to keep in mind as, a, as an instructor is besides the educational component, that we share with you is to help inspire you. And I know for me, what helped inspire me was my teachers showing me different artists, artists I never heard of, right? Now I'm a lot older than most of you probably watching this. So it was an even bigger deal, you know, cause you didn't hear about these artists. Nowadays you can go online and some of the people I've, I'm gonna mention today, you've heard of before through different, uh, different artists from different artists, right? Different YouTube channels, Instagram accounts, and so on, you've probably heard of most of them, but. Either way, hopefully, you know, hopefully we'll inspire you with, with at least one of them. So let's get started. Um, I wanna start over here, which is like, where does this all begin? I, I don't know. I, I have to actually do the research on where force began and see how far back it goes. I can tell you that the Gothic period before the Renaissance uh, was not extremely forceful, <laughs> right? Most artwork was very flat and two-dimensional and kind of lifeless and sort of vertically and horizontally stacked in the way things were designed. And then all of a sudden you had this explosion, right? And which today we know the, the core of that was basically in Italy, most of it in Florence itself. And that expanded outside of that city and to others as well. And probably the most world-renowned uh, force artists on the planet Earth would be Michelangelo, right? So here's some of his, you know, pieces. These are obviously from the uh, Sistine Chapel, uh, which if you haven't seen, um, I highly recommend you go see. Um, it's been a long time for me, I'd say, uh, uh, it might be 15, 20 years ago, I think I saw the Sistine Chapel, but amazing, right? Like totally breathtaking and you're surrounded, you know, just surrounded by by force, right, by fluidity. Italy in general, I would say, is an amazing country uh, if you're interested in force because every piazza you walk into has got some fantastic forceful uh, figurative sculpture in it. So, so here's one uh, Michelangelo piece. I grabbed one other one as well to, for you to see, right? And if you're new today and you don't know what force is at all, you're like, hey, I'm here. I, I heard about this thing with illustration. Um, you know, what we're looking at, let's do some quick overlays here. <clears throat> so sky blue is typically directional force and orange is applied, right? So if we take the sky blue brush, uh, you can see how, you know, Michelangelo has gone like this through the deltoid, right? And out the arm and then up over the wrist, right? Like such amazing rhythm. You can see the legs hook up into all this, right? Like all this flows so nicely into this moment that is, uh, you know, is iconic. It's, it's, it's like pop culture, quite frankly, at this point, right? 
Um, you know, and you can see that he did this here too, all the way down to the fingers, you know, it's like tiny little rhythms in the fingers, right? This must be God and Adam, I believe, from what I recall, right? Um, so all this fluidity is what makes this so elegant. This could have been an ET moment, <laughs> right? Could have just been like two stiff fingers, like pointing at each other like this, right? But that's not what happened, right? The fact that Michelangelo decided to put, um, you know, rhythm into this changes everything. It adds to this um, more elegant, uh, dare I say, spiritual moment, right? Of uh, his arm coming up like this and him bending down like that with his wrist, right? And then the two of them doing this, right? Pretty impressive, I have to say. Uh, and like I said, this we're going back 500 years ago, right? Uh, and then the same thing here, if we do an overlay on these, you know, you can see that we've got force coming into the shoulder and the sweeping out, again, the bent wrist, right? Wrists are huge. Here, you know, we're sweeping into the shoulder, out the arm, look at the curve in the finger, look at all the force sweeping into the shoulder, up into the arm, out the hand, up into the finger. All the cherubs, everything's moving. You know, the thing is with the Renaissance, man, they just knew how to make things move, right? His fabric, right? The fabric is fluid. Look at just how the flow of everything. Look at the outside, inside, outside on the leg, right? If you know anything about force, you've been with us, look at the templates on the legs, right? There it is, right? He's doing everything that we talk about on the website, right? So there it is. So lots of fluidity right lots of rhythm lots of force lots of great form right it's all sitting there it's in the renaissance <clears throat> you really want to get it firsthand like i said go go visit italy i have to say it's like the, the homeland so with that um we're going to come up very quickly to more current times more like the um more like the 1900s i have to say the 1900s actually were also a big blast of very um, skilled artists in the modern era of, um, of illustration, right? Specifically illustration. So with that, I think I'm gonna hand it over to Swenley. I'll do the slide work um, and Swenley can kind of talk us through. And, and it's open obviously for all of us to have conversation. This will be more of a group uh, conversation. Um, but we have these different artists, right? That we're bringing in here, right? So the first one we've got is, uh, is Dean Cornwell, right? Uh, what are your thoughts on Dean? Uh, I like his I like his drawings a lot. You know, it's got like it's kind of stylized but realistic at the same time. You know, it's not like as stylized as uh, uh, in terms of shapes as uh, someone like a Lion Decker, but uh, yet you see how how much he's he's designing a lot. You know, he's looking at reality and he's simplifying stuff. And uh, there's of course a lot of uh, force and rhythm. You know, you can see like the, the S curve on the torso in the first guy, you know, the guy on the screen left. Mm -hmm. you know, so everything is flowing and connecting, you know, very well structured as well. So yeah, I, I like his, his drawings a lot, I must say. So just to give you guys some background, um, Cornwall was born in 92 and he died, I think it was uh, 60, yes. He died in 1960. So he died actually not that long ago, right? So he was around basically from 1900 to 1960. Uh, he actually, I think he ran, let me check my facts here on what I wrote here. Yeah, he ran Society, Illust uh, Society of Illustrators in New York um, in the Art Students League. He was the president in the Society of Illustrators from 22 to 26, so for four years, right? Um, and he taught at the Art Students League in New York um, in that time also, like 20s and 30s. So he's a very well-known artist on, uh, on the East Coast. Uh, and I would say across the country, because if my memory serves me correctly, I'll double check this fact right now, but I'm pretty sure he did the, um, I think he did the library in Los Angeles, if I'm not mistaken. It was like one of his big pieces. Yeah, so he worked in a lot of magazines as Harper's Bazaar, Red Book, Good Housekeeping. Yeah, here it is. He painted the murals for the Los Angeles Library, for the Lincoln Memorial Shrine in the Redlands of California. So he had some pretty big, you know, some really big jobs, all the way from doing illustrations for magazines to just gigantic murals. A lot of the pieces that you see um, when you look him up are for, are for his mural work, actually. 
And to Swanley's point, I think what's amazing about Cornwell is that he um, he he knew how to draw, right? But he drew through the filter of design. The characters are very clearly designed. What does that mean? I mean, they're, they're not sketchy. You know, he's not he's not doing this and saying here's here's this guy holding uh, you know holding a thing of water, right? A vessel of water. He's not like this. Right, like he goes in there and like finalizes those curves, right? And they're very specific and clean. So he's designing, meaning he's really forming clear opinions about uh, the shapes themselves, and they're very forceful, right? So what Swanley was saying, you know, we have this sweeping into this and around. Here we come up over into the deltoid. We come to the elbow. We go out the hand, right? All the shapes are really good. They're straight to curve shape design, basically, right? So very modern, you know, like real. And when I say modern, I mean like this would hold up today. You know, he's doing things that that Disney Animation is doing, and here it is in the Dean Cornwell uh, painting for you know for a library in Los Angeles. Ironically, right, meaning that the entertainment industry is there. Right? Yes, a very good balance, especially if we would look at the guy on the screen left. Good balance between, to your point, two uh, D and three D. You know, which it's not an easy thing to do. Like. Can be kind of like mind boggling, you know, the thing two dimensional and three dimensional at the same time. But uh, you can see the clear shapes, and yet those shapes are created by forms, you know, so very skillfully done. Yeah, I've had a lot in mentorship this week. I've had quite a bit of conversation around, again, the combination of form and shape. And I keep I keep mulling over how to clarify it, clarify it for everyone as much as possible. And again, my new my new headspace for this is you know form is the foundation for shape, you know, and shape is really just a shortcut of form, right? It, but it's form first. Like you need that foundation, you need that structure, and therefore the silhouette is created. And when you're really good, you can go right for the shape because the form is in your head, right? And that's what you'll see a lot of professionals do on their videos. And then unfortunately it makes it look to you guys like, oh, I just need to draw shapes. But those artists have already gone through the years of practice of drawing the forms and the perspective to get to shapes. And what we try to add to this mix is that it's a forceful shape, right? So not only are you trying to think about forms, you're trying to think about forms that move and those two things combine to create appealing or forceful shape, right? And Cornwell is doing that. And me just even talking through it, you could see like, oh, that's that's a pretty, that's a lot of skill. It's a pretty big hurdle, right? And here he is doing all three of those things very beautifully with numerous figures, right? To tell stories. So, you know, further complication. Not only can he draw, of course, as you can see here, he's an amazing painter, right? Spectacular, spectacular painter. Yeah, there's a lot of force in the composition as well, you know, like there's a flow to all the pictures, you know, it's like a clear path that leads us to the pictures, just like the path of force lead us through the whole body. Yeah. yeah, look at this, this is kind of cool with this guy here, and you can see this guy's between the legs there, and she's there, they're all like making their way, you know, to this guy on the ground, the rock is pointing there. Right here, the subject matter is here, and you'll notice how the figures, the hand, right, all of them are moving, right? So Forrest, to Swenley's clever point, is the figures themselves become forceful trajectories to say, look here. So force can be used as, you know, as a compositional tool, right, as well as drawing the figures. And imagine that you get clever enough that you're good enough to pose figures in a way to just make the bodies do what you want them to do to best tell the story, right? Pretty amazing. And like I said, there's this painting skill on top of that, which is also extremely, extremely skilled. So yeah, really good. I love Cornwell. I don't know how I got introduced to Cornwell. I wish I could remember. Um, but I do, re I do remember, it must've been before Disney because I had a Cornwell painting that I had. I had a Cornwell and I had some um, clays that I had printed out that were next to my desk at Disney working there. And one of them was this crazy uh, Cornwall painting that I really loved. So this guy, of course, has respectfully gotten all the fame that he deserves, you know, especially over the last 20 or 30 years, um, is J.C. Leyendecker, right? Uh, any thoughts um, from you, Swanley, before I get 
dig into him? Yeah, for me, Leyendecker is like the ultimate shape master because I haven't seen uh, rarely or maybe any artist that is this skillful with shape. Like he takes shape to the like most little details in, in his drawings. Like everything is designed, you know, nothing is like uh, sloppy or loose. Everything is designed to be a force shape. So uh, extremely skillful, you know, it's uh, a big inspiration to look at. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, what's amazing is, like you said, everything actually has shape design to it, right? Um, and he does it in a kind of angular way, which kind of crisps up the shapes, you know? I think there's sort of a misconception that force has to be super swoopy and curvy and, and curved lines kind of lead their way towards um, kind of caricature or cartooniness. Someone I didn't bring in here is um, Al Hirschfeld, right? Al Hirschfeld was sort of the king of the swoopy spaghetti line. Um, and you got line decker on the other end, right? Where things are a little bit more angular, but still forceful. So you can have line, like I said, that has some sharper points in it and still keep flow going. You know, we can easily go right over any of these line decker images, right? Here's this horse, right? And see how I could follow this, right? It flows, right? It goes like this. It's actually the, for next week, we're gonna be doing force animals, by the way. Um, and you can see here's the force animal shape, right? Which is right out of the book, you see? So there it is, right? Here it is too. I didn't get it from Leindecker, by the way, but you could see Leindecker is using it also, right? So, you know, he's he's understands how to take those shapes. And, and what's amazing, what's really amazing about Leindecker is that this goes all the way down to him shaping out lights and shadows and all this stuff and how it gets, you know, designed. So a little history on Leindecker. Leindecker was, um, he was born in 74, 1874. So he was older than um, Cornwell, right? He came before Cornwell and he died in 70, at, seven, at the age of 77 in the early 50s, around 51. Um, so, you know, just slightly before Cornwell, he was really famous for these um, Saturday evening post uh, covers, which is most of the artwork that you see of his. He worked for a lot of other companies as well. Um, I heard, I'd have to look this up. I'm kind of skimming here a profile on him. But I remember hearing from someone that supposedly uh, the great Gatsby was actually um, inspired by Leyendecker, uh, that he was an extremely wealthy artist and businessman, uh, which is, you know, as you know, is rare, right? We've all, we all still are under the umbrella of thinking of the starving artist, right? And trying not to be that. Um, and that he was not that, <laughs> you know, like he's, He's an artist that had a lot of fame and a lot of good fortune in the time that he was alive. Um, I don't remember how he died. I'm looking at, I don't recall how he actually passed away, but uh, anyway, JC Leindecker, right? I can't tell you how many people have been inspired by Leindecker. Most of the artwork I'm probably even gonna show today, especially the contemporaries, I guarantee they've all looked at Leindecker, you know, and you'll, you'll see that, you know, you'll see that. So look here, we were just talking about angular lines. Look at the baby. Right, the baby is not angular at all, right? The baby is super curvy, right? It's like this, like this. Look at these fat round legs that babies have. Look at the arms, right? So he knew how to go from that to yet these moments of these like crisp corners, for instance, in the hair. You know, so he's creating forces that do this to forces that do this. Here, let me do it in black so you guys can see better. Right, it's all about like these radiuses, right? Like, am I going to take corners? Am I going to round them out, or am I going to sharpen them up? Right, like what what will happen there? Okay. All right. Norman Rockwell. So Rockwell was out, you know, was alive and working around the same time as Leindecker. Um, let's see, Norman Rockwell. What did you think about Rockwell? Uh, Mr. Swanley, and Mertunje, jump in on all this too. I'm asking Swanley just because he grabbed these images, but. Yeah, Rockwell is obviously like more, much more realistic, you know, but still the, uh, like the one thing that's similar in all these artists, no matter the style is the underlying concept of force, you know, like those rhythms and forceful form and shape design is out there. And it applies to all range of styles, you know, from super abstract to super realistic. 
like Rockwell here? Yeah. Yeah, I would say Rockwell is definitely more realistic. Um, same time period as Linedecker. So Rockwell was born, ironically, in February. I always have an epiphany for, uh, not epiphany, uh, a love for February because I'm February 8th. <laughs> so anytime there's any great artist, I'm like, look, look, of course I have, must have some kind of talent there. Their birthday is close to mine, right? As stupid as that may sound, but um, so he's February 3rd, right? And uh, he, he, God, he lived all the way to the seventies, right? Not only was he, he was 77, but he also lived into the 1970s until where I was born. Um, and, you know, Rockwell, all these guys, let me back up. All these guys, by the way, one question that comes up quite, quite often uh, with artists is the idea of reference or not reference or using or not using it or cheating or not cheating. You know, and you have people, all the artists we've shown you so far, they all use reference, by the way, right? They all had their studios. They would literally hire people from the street, right? And go, oh my God, I love the look of that person. Rockwell will bring these people in and photograph them, set them up in entire scenes, right? And photograph that and then paint it. And it's their style meaning their filter, the way they saw things and the fact that they pose the models in certain ways to tell story that makes their work, their work, right? And I think for me, Rockwell, uh, when I think Rockwell, I think story. I think Decker, he has story, but I don't think about that. I think about his amazing ability to, to design and the way he paints. To me, for Rockwell, I think about story. I think he really, really, really tried to push these story moments. And like I said, he would go out and he would just get people even from around town to come in and photograph them. You know, he would set this stuff up, right? Uh, at Line Decker did the same thing, by the way. You know, he would set up scenes and get the models in there, you know? It's kind of cool if you think about it. Imagine if you really invested your time and money in that. You'd have a studio at your house and you all these like fun props. And when you go out shopping on the weekends, you're looking for weird clothing and swords and armor and whatever your next painting is going to be. It was a much richer thing nowadays, right? We just like type up digital reference on Google, but imagine like going shopping and buying this stuff and building up your own collection of, you know, of props. I think it's actually kind of fun. And then directing the models, right? And getting what you want and then finally going in and doing the work. So no wonder these things were amazing, right? Because look at how much effort went into them before the artist even really sat down and started to draw or paint them. So like I said, Rockwell, um, to me, he's the story guy. Rockwell for me also reminds me of Steven Spielberg and um, George Lucas, by the way. Um, they're both big, um, they're fond um, collectors of Rockwell. Same with Decker, by the way. Uh, the guys in this period, but mostly a lot of Rockwell, I would say. In fact, I think there's a book out, a published book that shows you the collection that both of those directors have. And there's a lot of these artists in there. And you know, the, it's story, right? Interesting that two of the biggest directors in the world um, are surrounded by the illustrators of the early 1900s who were pushing for story, right? I, I, always, I always find that very um, uh, thought provoking, right? Any questions from the group? I haven't looked at the live chat yet since I've been talking away here. Anything, anything? No. All right, good. I hope you guys are enjoying yourselves so far. Um, so we covered, um, you know, Michelangelo, right? We covered uh, Dean Cornwell, J.C. Liondecker, right? And last but not least, Norman Rockwell, right? All amazing skilled artists whose fame was really mostly like 30s, 40s, 50s. You got that time period where there was a, a lot of just fantastic illustration happening, especially in the United States. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not as cognizant around the world, but in the U.S., these guys were the heavy hitters, right? Okay, so onward. So Mutunjay put together the next set. We go more here into our line guys, okay? So uh, you wanna talk to us about Mr. Frazetta? Um, yes, I'll be proud to. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's like, uh, what, it's like so, I mean, every line that you can see that it really proves a point, you know, what we're actually saying on the website every time is like every line should have a meaning to it. And look here, you know, that's like a live example of Mr. Frank Frazetta. And he, I, I just researched some, something about like him and he's like, and he started like very early age. It's like, he started like making comics at about 16, you know, as like mm -hmm. first job. 
and he's like doing like cleanup. So yeah, I mean, amazing, you know, one, the piece on the left, the, on the far left that you can see on the screen there, uh, we use this a lot, you know, and this is the assignment for students on the drawingfirst.com, by the way, when they're learning form. Um, it's due to the, the very dynamic composition, as you can see, the figures are kind of related to each other. So there's a story, okay, like, like story moments is very strong there. Sculpting, obviously, you know, <laughs> myself being a line lover. Uh, yeah, you can see like all the sculpting at the, the back, you know, the guy, the zombie guy is like being thrown away, you know, into that uh, composition basically with all the um, support by the lines, you know. You can see that actually the lines actually flowing through the anatomy and still um, creating light and shadow plus uh, form, obviously. And uh, yeah, so everything's like uh, amazing there. Uh, and by the way, the sketches on the right, the, the one with the horse thing, you know, see how loose that is. But again, uh, it doesn't, um, I mean, the line, you know, actually shows a story through this, you know, with all the dynamic and the motion in there. So yeah, really, really amazing. And I, I mean, yeah, they just like master at sculpting and line work, <laughs> super great. You know, um, first of all, as I was saying, Frizzetta was born February 9th, so the day after me. <laughs> Right. Just want to put that out there. But um, and he was born in Brooklyn, which is where I was born. <laughs> so you have to be born in Brooklyn and you have to be born at the beginning of February to be a force artist now. That was just February 4th, 4th February, right? Um, to me, there's to, to each one of these artists, I, I have these different sort of uh, little thought bubbles, you know, those different concepts that come to mind for me. For Zeta, you know, I got to know Frank's wife really well because I used to go to his museum all the time in Pennsylvania. And I unfortunately never got to meet him, but I talked to his wife, Eleanor, many, many times. Um, and I've looked at his work, you know, his paintings with my face only a few inches from them looked at. And his artwork, his paintings were almost like bulletproof, like kind of slick. It was almost really hard to like break them down and see how he made them. But um I, I think what makes Frazetta Frazetta is besides his skill, like putting all of that aside, it's like the guy loved drama, right? And Frazetta, if you dig into Frazetta, you will find tons of photographs of him. He would use himself as a model, right? To pose in all kinds of crazy dynamic poses. And he owned, or his family now does, I would imagine, like acres of land out in Pennsylvania where the um, museum was or is. Uh, so he's got pictures of him like out in the forest, you know, or in the grass, like taking on all these like these dynamic poses. So he really got it. I think I think when you see Frank and you see these illustrations, this is the kind of stuff that went on in his head. You know, he lived in this world. You know, he loved the drama of the sort of Tarzan-esque landscape and you know, cave almost caveman Neanderthal-esque guys and gorillas and beautiful voluptuous women and animals, you know, like just, you know, and fantasy, fantasy art, right? I mean, he owned that space. For me, the other thing that comes up with Frazetta is he really got famous off of his first uh, Conan cover. The Conan cover itself, um, that book sold really well. And he got recognized for that cover. That's when his career really took off. Prior to that, he was doing a lot of comic book work. I don't think he was as famous or well-known until that Conan came out. And there's this myth, I don't know how real or not it is, but the myth is that, you know, when Frazetta was younger, he went to try to go and get a comic book job. And the editor said, you need to learn um, anatomy. So he went and supposedly used the um, George Bridgman books over the weekend, like redrew every drawing in the book, came back with him like the next week and the editor hired him, right? I don't know if it's true or not. This is the, the, the legend <laughs> that I've, I'm carrying forth to you guys that I have heard. It sounds awesome. I, I hope it's true because it's such a great little story. I don't know if it's true or not. Um, there, you can see, I think, definitely some um, comparison, some recognition, I think, across Bridgman and Frazetta's work. You really start to look at the way uh, Frazetta sketches. You could see some of Bridgman in that. Uh, either way, you know, amazing. Um, I love Frazetta. And uh, he was a huge inspiration. For me, my four years of school, uh, it was like not only my teachers, like Frazetta was my other teacher in my back pocket because like I said, I would continuously visit the museum and I would and I have a ton of his books that I was just mulling over and studying over those four years. So 
had a very huge effect on on my learning curve you know and uh, maybe me and being force guy and thinking about how i love drama also like some part of frank is in me too you know like i love this kind of stuff right uh, exactly. i think he died very recently right and i think in 2010 so 10 yeah may of 2010 he died right so yeah not that long ago right yeah how yeah. old was he? <laughs> So 10, he was like around, uh, let's see, 50, 67, it was probably like late 70s or so. I think he was almost around 80 or I thought early 80s, somewhere in there. A lot of these guys, you know, yeah, I would say most of them make it until like their mid 70s. Frazetta, you know, I have to tell you, I think it's amazing that he made it this far because he basically, from the stories I've heard, would sit in a room with like open turpentine bottles, like. 10 hours a day. <laughs> so the fact that he even lived as long as he did with all those fumes is quite impressive. This is a beautiful uh, page. I love the way you put this together. Um, so, you know, here's more Frazetta. I, I talk about this piece in mentorship because it's interesting that he uses these force lines in the shadows, as you can see here. And here he's breaking the direction of the form because the form of the leg is going away from us. But he's like, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to get form with the turning edge. And instead he, he sculpts out the shadows in the direction of the swing of Tarzan's body, right? So kind of interesting. And here I really like how the gradient of shadow keeps going up in the same direction as the swing of the body and then comes up over the top like so, right? Also pretty awesome. All right, and then who else have we got? We've got Mr. Gibson, right? Yep, another sculpting sculpting legend <laughs> yes yeah so both the sculpting legends um for me for zeta from a force standpoint trumps um uh, now i can't say trumps anymore because there's all kinds of attachment going back to it right depending on what side of the fence you're on so i think that for zeta beats gibson when it comes to um when it comes to force gibson was an amazing sculptor of line. I call him the lumberjack or the chopper, right? Because he's like chopping into all this. So he was born, he was 67. Again, same time period, right? All these guys were born in late 1800s and lived to around the mid 1950s to 70s, right? It's like this 20 year flux at the beginning and end, right? And all these guys were in that same time, which, you know, you got to wonder, right? It's just something about that time period where there's this incredible amount of skill and some very, very famous artists came out of that time period, right? So this is Charles Dana Gibson, right? Just fantastic. If I have any personal note on this, I love his work. And uh, anytime I went to um, like antique shops, I would always look at the book sections, hoping that someday I would find something. And one time I actually did in, in Pennsylvania, I went to an antique shop and I actually found these two uh, fabric bound tabloid sized books filled with Gibson drawings. So hopefully when I have time after my move and all, at some point I would love to try to photograph this so that you know we have a huge collection of, of Gibson's work to share, um, but really, really impressive. So who is this? <laughs> this is Clay. Yes. Yeah. Let's see, when was Clay born? Let's find out if he was in February or not. <laughs> Heinrich Clay. No, nope, April. April 15th, right? So Clay was German, uh, German satirist. Uh, I, from what I remember in my readings, he really was against the Industrial Revolution. So he's got a lot of sarcastic imagery towards the Industrial Revolution. He also um, supposedly inspired Fantasia. Disney was very aware of Clay. And um, he's got, you know, dancing alligators and flamingos uh, and elephants on ice skates and so on. And Disney was very inspired by that and brought a lot of those ideas into the first Fantasia film. And on one, back, just to back up a step with Gibson, um, because talking about Disney, Disney actually loved Gibson's work as well, so much so that in Disneyland, there is actually an ice cream shop um, that's named after Charles Dana Gibson that has some prints, I guess, of his work inside um, inside the ice cream store. So 
these guys from this period, you know, Disney wasn't ignorant of what was going on out there and who the top artists were. He was bringing them in as he does still today, right? That still happens at the studio. So, you know, working with people like Clay or working with someone like Gibson, even Frazetta, I believe that Frazetta actually was brought into Disney. Um, I can't remember at what time period, but he, but he came in there as a, like a concept artist basically for Disney at one point in time. So a lot of these guys had this relationship with Disney animation, which is, is quite amazing. You know, Mike Mignola, which, you know, I, I love, um, worked as a concept artist for um, Atlantis, right? So the animation studio is very aware of, you know, what's going on. I mean, it's a place filled with artists, right? So they're always telling the internal teams, like, you need to look at this person or this person. So clay is really awesome. I like using clay to help students relax, you know, to realize drawings don't have to be super tight and perfect in this digital world we live in. And we're going to show some of this later. A lot of the best out there are, are amazing, so amazingly skilled that they've refined their craft to this tight work. But that doesn't mean that's the end. There's lots of different styles in drawing. And I think clay is a great example of, look, you could be loose and forceful and fluid as well, right? Yeah, and look at the stories. Time, yeah. Like bringing the organicness into the line, which I like really like because like, you, as you can see, like the elephants are there and the wrinkly skin that we can like feel in the line itself. Mm -hmm. So very great use of like line texture, I would say, you know, and yeah. So yeah, bringing yeah, organic. It's, cool. <laughs> it's very good. Cool. Yeah, look at this little hippo on the wall, like staring at the two of them. <laughs> right, it's so funny. And look at the baboon, you know, he's got his tail wrapped around his umbrella with a top hat, right? I guess he's a doctor, right? See, because look, he's looking at the elephant. The elephant has hurt his leg, right? So, so weird, right? It's such little interesting stories, you know? Really gotta love, uh, gotta love Clay. Clay, by the way, you know, you can get Clay's books for pretty inexpensive on Amazon. You know, they're like $15, $18 and they're amazing, you know, just amazing draftsmanship, you know? So let's move up to current time. We're, we're running out of time and I have a few more artists I want to share with you. The first one is Wiley Beckert. Um, to me, Wiley Beckert bumps up really well against Dean Cornwell and, uh, you know, uh, JC Leindecker, uh, like a modern version of these famous artists from the early 1900s and you know i hope wiley takes this as a huge compliment because it's meant to be one um, i think that her um work is just super solid extremely well designed you can see all the love and care that she puts into her work it takes time to create this stuff you know and she she just puts so much craft you know there's so much craft into this right like look at this drawing right just fantastic Right, it's got force, it's got form. I love all the structure that's like hidden in here, right? Everything is really solid and designed, but fluid with a touch of angularity, right? I don't know Wiley personally, but I would be shocked to say she doesn't know who JC Leindecker is, right? Like look at the work, right? Look at the look at the inspiration, right? It has such a line decker esque feel. And I'm sure that's not her only inspiration, but it has to be one of them. It's just gotta be, right? Look, look at the way this stuff is designed. Beautifully, beautifully crafted, beautifully crafted, you know? Patiently and lovingly created, just fantastic work, right? Here's the piece that was on the thumbnail, right? Again, I just thought, man, that is so awesome. It's challenging. This is like Cornwell, right? It's challenging to bring force, form, and shape all together at this skill level and then so cleanly done and then rendered so cleanly, all the gradation, like, man, lots, like I said, lots of love and patience to, to put this stuff down, you know, really beautiful. Wiley, of course, is alive, you know, she's a current artist. So all the ones I'm going to show you now are people who are alive today, right? And you can check out Wiley. Um, she's got an account on Instagram, so I highly recommend you go there. Let me just get rid of this so you see her name. If you type in her name, you'll find her, her Instagram account. Just amazing. You could say, hey, uh, I found out about you on Mike Matezzi's YouTube channel. <laughs> Maybe she'll reach out. We could become friends. <laughs> so it's Wiley Becker. The next one I think all of you know at this point, and that's Loish, right? Loish has become super, super famous over the last, uh, what, maybe 10, 15 years or so. And again, respectfully and rightfully so, just beautiful work. I think what impresses me about Loish more than anything is 
Uh, well, first of all, not only does she draw well, but I, I love her sense of color. It's very unique, you know, and she's really willing to push into very hot, acidic color schemes, which most artists don't do. It's kind of scary to go out into that space, and it's really easy for things to get ugly fast. And she's very good at living in that space, and she gets these really rich, vibrant colors going on, and, and it works, and it's fine. Uh, so I super respect that. The other thing I love about Loish is... Um, she not only draws people well with force, she draws everything well with force. Like everything she touches has a sense of movement to it. It doesn't matter if it's like the smoke here in the background, you know, if it's the sense of magic and these globular magic things that she's doing here. It doesn't matter if she's drawing digitally or traditionally. It doesn't matter if it's faces or bodies, right? Everything has this like purposeful pushed sense of design. It always feels like things are going somewhere. She, she really does have almost an animator's mindset um, in how she works. And I don't think she's an animator, um, but man, she knows how to get that feel in there. You know, I brought this in here too, to prove, look, look at the sense of movement in the background, right? Look at the upward sweep in the mountains. You see, everything is going somewhere. Girl's hair is going somewhere. The shape of the blue against the green is green is all sweeping upwards. The clouds are moving. It's this sense of motion. It's everything has a trajectory. Everything has force in it, right? Which I think is pretty damn uh, spectacular and not that easy to not that easy to pull off. And she can draw animals really well. I could have grabbed a ton of animals. I just thought these guys were cute. Um, I think this is the elephant shrew, from what I recall. Um, so even the animals, right, have a sense of movement. Now she doesn't push movement in there uh, without form, right? You'll notice that everything is still well structured. It has good shape design, right? And it has force and, and you know, fluidity to it. I love this guy's nose. Like, I really love this drawing right here, All right? Look at the rhythm of the guy's back, right? Into his chest and then out the nose, out the little curved nose. And beautiful line, you know? There's just like a sense of beauty and grace, you know, to what she's doing. Yeah, I, I love her work. Uh, you guys have anything to say? People are, you know, like when they're, when I'm teaching them basics, you know, they're always like, you know, I don't want my drawings to like, uh, you know, look like, okay, you know, they had like, like specific rhythms. It's like, I don't want that soft touch to be seen in my drawing. And these illustrators, like you can see the word there, they really prove the point that your drawings don't need to be looked like that, you know? You can, yeah. just for your understanding, you know, just understand like how like things work in the real world and then you can go with any type of line that you want, right? So mm -hmm. example, Lois share. So you can still see the forceful shape in there, but she's not using that, uh, the sweeps or the soft touch and, you know, just like that, so. Yeah. So uh, Valerie just said in the chat that Lois was trained as an animator. Right. So I don't know much about her. I don't know her background, but it would make total sense to me if she was trained as an animator because her move, her drawings have direction. Right. They're forceful because she's thinking things are always moving somewhere. And that really shows up. You're going to say something, Swanley? Uh, no, I was just trying to make this point. I think some students worry too much about style from the very beginning. You know, it's like mm -hmm. learn how to draw, learn how to design first, and then you can do anything you want. You know, you don't need to like uh, worry so much about that stuff at the start. Yeah, I always, I will always say, I think style is your skill and your lack of skill, <laughs> right? It's like style gets you to the place of how good your ability is and how you draw and how you see things and also what you just don't have the ability to do, you know, right? So all of a sudden you start finding a space that you like. Maybe you don't want to go any further. Maybe you don't want to go and learn other things. You like the way your work starts looking. You enjoy doing it the way you like doing it. I think when you can get to a place where you're drawing in it, you're in the zone, um, you know, you start finding home, you know, basically. And I think a lot of the artists that we're sharing today um, really found their own internal home, you know, and I think Loish has found her home, like Loish is Loish, you know. And by the way, again, I didn't say this earlier, there are hundreds of artists I could have brought into today's session. We're showing you a very, very, very tiny slice. There are many, many artists that I think use force in their drawings and in their work that I'm not showing today. I just grabbed like the few top ones that come to mind that I, I hear or talk, talk about on like a weekly basis, you know? So anyway, Lois is one of them. Right. Amazing color, amazing drawings. And she does it across animals, backgrounds, you know, uh, everything she gets her hands on. 
And is like Valerie said, if she's trained as an animator, it makes total sense, right? So one of my other favorites that I found on Instagram, so thank goodness for something like Instagram, is Max Breck. I love this guy's work. Again, if I were to go back to the illustrators from before, I see Lion Becker, right? I, I would bet that Max Greck knows who J.C. Lion Decker is, right? There's a sense of the sharp cornering, forceful, fluid shapes with very strongly bent. What I mean by strongly is tense curves, curves that are not super fluid, but bent under pressure, right? Just barely bent, almost straight, right? There's like a tension in his, uh, in his work. Lots of pointy corners, right? What I love about uh, Max's work is he keeps this design aesthetic going underneath, this very force-shaped design aesthetic. But on top of it, he knows how to paint really well. So he can paint either like this, which is more like a cartoon or a comic book, more 2D painted, right? Same here. This has a little bit more gradation in it, right? You see subtle changes from light to dark are happening in here. Little bit more rendering. Notice the designing is still the same. You know, it's this kind of cartoony feel. A little more round than the other guy, right? The other guy, a little more angular. This is a little softer, a little more round. And then look, he can do this. This looks like it's off of a reference. I hope it's off of a reference. I got to tell you, because it's painted so realistically well, and yet he stylized the realism and then painted it with photoreality, right? Like, Look at the high specularity on her butt, right? And these, these pants, like super high sheen. Look at the drop shadows, you know? It just, it feels right. It feels like this is a photograph taken with a, a flash camera, right? And, you know, he just nailed whatever he needed to nail to make this work. And he has the skill to know what to look for in the photography to bring that sense of realism, you know, over here, right? So incredibly well done. And then here's a piece that's kind of in the middle, um, not middle from painting style, but more of I wanted you to see a full figure, right? So, you know, be aware, be aware that, you know, like, as I was just saying, force doesn't have to be super round, you know, like this arm that he's drawing here just about squeezes itself out to have a subtle curve this way and then a stronger one like this, right? And then this goes like this and goes like this, you see? And then the curve of his body is like this, and this is going like this, and this is going like this, and this is going like this, you see? So if you were to draw a stick figure, right, the big difference is to say, hey, I've got a character that's doing this, right? There's that, and then there's this. And look at the big difference this makes. And this is what Max is doing, you know? He, he just goes out of straight, right? And just takes that bar and bends it a little bit to give it more forceful shape design, right? More fluidity to it. But it's crisp, you know? What I mean by that is it's still very sharp cornered. You know, we look at this arm, Right? You look more closely at what's going on. And you know, we have here we have a tapered shape. So his upper arm is like this, it's tapering in, right? So force is flowing through there. He's got this elbow poking out, a little concave, huge convex, right? And then we've got our smaller bump here, and then a straight, which I tell everybody that's like the generic shape of the form, right? And it goes like this. So what you do is if you can kind of um, average this out, here's the shape. Right? Remember the shape is the shortcut of the form, right? You average this out. You can see within it that if you squint at it, this is a strong is stronger than this is. So in here, the average trajectory of that limb is like that, right? And Greg's Max Greg gets that, you know? And sometimes it's really close. I mean, look at this leg. This leg's kind of cool because um, you know, the beginning of it could be a tube like this, but that's not good, right? At least not for, like I said, force shape. As we know, that's a bad shape. So Max could have done this, right? So curve to straight, 
that's good. That gives us force, right? We're curving now through here. You can see the average is an arc, but he cleverly does something else that we talk about. Uh, and that is he also pushes depth in here. Notice he actually pinches, he goes narrower on the back end and a little wider on the front end, so just a subtle curve. There's just a subtle trajectory running through there. So the reason it's smaller on the back end and bigger on the front end is because it brings the knee forward, right? We have space, it gives us depth, right? So subtle, not very big, you know, it doesn't make it, you know, it could have been this, could have been like that, right? Had that knee really pop out, but he doesn't do that, just enough to make it believable in that space. And the leg's not coming out that far, right? But again, I think he's looked at Linedecker. I think Lowish has looked at, I think all these guys have looked at Linedecker. You know, at one point, uh, you know, at one point in time or another, I think anyone who's got this kind of cartoony, like angular style, has had to look at line deck at one point or another. And he's got influences from other, I think, places as well. But I'm sure he's he's looked at them. You know, beautiful work. Like I said, uh, I think Greg not only has great design aesthetic. Um, I love what he paints. He comes up with, like really crazy, kooky stuff. He plays on horror sometimes, which is really fun. Um, and he can paint, man. The guy can paint crazy good, you know, all the way from flat, like I said, 2D cartooning coloring to very photorealistic if he wants to, you know. So check him out. All right, last but not least, um, I want to talk about James Jean. So some of you may not have heard of James Jean. Um, earlier in his years, like 2000s or so, well, yeah, let's go, let's go here. Earlier in his, his career, James became really famous for doing the Fable uh, comic book covers. And as you can see, uh, they were profound, you know, probably from a skill st standpoint, I would say far above even what you see on most comic book covers. Just amazing, amazing work, right? So as most of you may know, I used to have a school in California, a, a brick and mortar art school called Entertainment Art Academy. And every weekend we would have guest artists come in and I would always ask the um, audience who they wanted me to get next. Like I, I got, I don't know, I got fearless for that time and just calling up whoever anybody wanted me to call up. And I would just try to get them into, into the school. So um, this name, James Jean kept coming up over and over and over again. I was like, all right, I'm just gonna finally look him up. And ironically, he lived in, uh, in the Santa Monica area from what I recall. And I was in Pasadena. So he was, you know, 45 minutes an hour away, which was amazing, right? So I called him up and was like, hey, my name is Mike Matese. I'm in this art school. Uh, everyone here wants you to come up and do a talk. You'd be interested. And he's like, Mike, he's like, you don't remember me? <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? You know, he's like, you taught me at SVA, right? And I was like, wow, that's awesome. Do you mind if I tell everybody that, <laughs> right? Because he was, he, he was more, he had more fame, honestly, at that point that I had anticipated. I had not heard of his work yet. And I wasn't collecting comics at the time. I was too busy in the school. To make a long story short, he was the first artist that I had at my school where people were flying in from different states and countries to come and see him, right? They would fly in from other places to come and see this talk. And I was like, damn, James, like, what have you been up to? <laughs> you know, so this is what he was up to. You know, he was just, he was doing these profound, um, illustrations for these comic book covers, right? And to his credit, um, here, I want to go back to earlier, James. Even So once I met him, I recognized his face. I was like, ah, yeah, I remember you. So I taught James in the late 90s. And uh, you can see in his drawings, his skill level, okay? So before we were talking about style, right? We were like, what, you know, it's like what you do and what you don't do, how far can you take it? James can see crystal clear, right? Like laser clear vision. He can see exactly what's going on in the real world, which means now he has total control over where do I want to take it? To me, if you can get to that place, now you're in total control. It's like, okay, I know what reality is and I see all the things in reality. Where do I want to go with it? You could stay there or you can manipulate. You know, again, I go to Picasso, look at Picasso. Here's someone else who was in total control, had full sense of visual clarity, and decided to go into abstraction, right? So here was James, here's just sketchbook drawings of his, right? Just beautiful force, fluidity, lots of surface line. He loved surface line, a lot of sculpting, and he would take that to create um, rhythm and movement and mass, right? I love this page. There's just some beautiful, um, beautiful, beautiful drawings. Look at all the force in the pants and him just studying this, right? And this is all like ballpoint pen. 
So, you know, you can just imagine how delicate he is with his line and how controlled he is. Very calm. He's very calm and very focused, you know. That, that's one thing I remember very clearly about him. Um, so here's, this is all the work, like I said, he was doing. Now, over the last 15, 20 years, um, you know, James here. So these are his, uh, like I said, these are the covers. James has moved over to fine art, right? So now this is more current James, which is amazing because if you look at his comic book work, you'll see the beginnings of this in that work. There's subtlety about what he likes to draw and paint and where the style is going. And this is what he does now. And, you know, and he does these gigantic paintings. And now he's become one of the world's most famous fine artists, right? So he went through illustration for comic book covers and now is actually pushed into fine art. And would somebody look at this and go, oh, that's a force drawing? No, but there's force in this, right? You can see all the rhythms. He still knows how to hold on to flow and rhythm and fluidity. There's a sense of romanticism in this even in the flower petals and the vines and the branches, right? Everything has a sense of grace and motion all the way back to Michelangelo and the Renaissance, right? It's like the modern day of the Renaissance. You have someone like James Jean in his work, which is also, you could see, you know, sort of uh, Japanese, you know, Asian style influence in here as well, which he is uh, by the way, right? And how that's showing up in his work. So I wanna to close today with this image, which is, um, you know, James, a, a show of his, I think this was, I forget if this was South Korea or if it was in Japan, but you know, now he has these um, exhibits that go on around the world of his work of these huge paintings in his style that started with him learning how to draw with force, right? And I didn't teach him how to paint. I didn't teach him how to put these images together, but I was there to teach him how to draw, right? And that, is still in his work today. You can see the sense of movement and rhythm in the work. And I'm just super proud of him. You know, look at how far someone can actually take this. Um, and we only have a few minutes left. I wanna close with one thing I noticed in putting this together today, you know, with Swenli and Mutunje is, um, man, all these artists that we've shown you, you know, we, we were able to pull them out of the ether because they've become famous, you know, in their space because they found the way that they work, you know, their, their love, you know, of their art. And I think that's a challenging thing to do. I think it takes, you know, it takes time. It takes time. It takes time to sit down and just do the work to be able to, to basically discover yourself, to find yourself. And, you know, we can say this is James Jean and this is his work. This is Lowish. This is her work, right? Uh, because these people are, you know, drawing day in and day out to put in the time and the practice to get to this place. So if you're new and you're out there, you know, and you're trying to learn how to draw, beware every other artist before you, all the way from Picasso to Michelangelo to any of us sitting here to James Jean or Loish, have put in way more hours than any of you can anticipate <laughs> to get to where we are. You know, same with Swami Matunje, right? Like we've all put in a lot of time since our childhoods, typically, not always, but typically. Uh, to get that far. And I say not always because I, I can, I have students right now I know that I'm teaching that have only been drawing for maybe three to five years who are doing incredibly, incredibly well, like professional level skill drawing, right? So it's definitely possible to do it in a shorter amount of time, but no matter what, you got to put in the time. It's not magic. You know, you just got to put in the time and effort. So I close with go and draw, you know, go and paint, be aware of what you love doing and don't love doing, right? As you're working and allow that to help guide you to find yourself. And one of the most amazing careers out there, obviously as an artist is to be an illustrator. And illustration, like I said, is not just book covers. There's lots of avenues to illustration. There's, there's medical illustration, right? There's, like I said, there's children's book and regular book illustration, there's book cover illustration, there's editorial illustration. There's mechanical illustration and design. And then of course you go into entertainment, illustration can bleed its way over into stuff like concept art, right? So um, yeah, that's it. Do you guys have anything else you wanna close up with? No, it was uh, inspiring. Yeah. I want to go and draw myself. Yeah, I wanna go find myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I wanna go do. It'd be nice to have more time to just sit and see where, it all, where it's all supposed to go. I think for me, you know, in closing on a very personal note, that is a big question I always ask myself 
is where am I supposed to go before I leave this earth? Where is my work supposed to go? Where am I supposed to take it? What else do I have in me? You know, the only way to find out is to sit and do the work, you know? So my challenge is finding the time, I think, to do that. Cause I love teaching. You know, I never want to get rid of that. I love teaching, but at the same time, it takes away from me figuring out what's my personal growth. Where, where, where does Mike Matese go next? I, I don't know. Right. I need the time to sit and figure that out. So just be aware, you guys, if you want to do that, you got to just put in the time and effort. Okay. So have an excellent weekend, everyone. And we will see you guys next Friday. We're going to talk about animal drawing. Okay. So have a great week. Go practice drawing some animals and uh, we'll see you next Friday. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. You guys. Bye-bye.